Welcome to this. Oops. Welcome to this Sunday service. Um, I'm going to open with a poem by Madeline Elangle as she developed it from a sixth-century Christian tradition called O Antiphons. O come, thou wisdom from on high, like any babe at life you cry. For me, like any mother, birth was hard, O light of earth. O come, O come, thou Lord of might, whose birth came hastily at night. Born in a stable in blood and pain, is this the king who comes to reign? O come, thou rod of Jesse's stem, the stars will be thy diadem. How can the infinite finite be? Why choose, child, to be born of me? O come, thou king of David, come. Open the door to my heart home. I cannot love thee as a king, so fragile and so small a thing. O come, thou dayspring from on high, I saw the signs that marked the sky. I heard the beat of angels' wings, I saw the shepherds and the kings. O come, desire of nations be, simply a human child to me. Let me not weep that you are born. The night is gone, now gleams the morn. O come, O come, Emmanuel, within this fragile vessel to dwell. O child conceived by heaven's power, give me thy strength, it is the hour. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, God's son, God's self, with us to dwell. Let us prepare our hearts, minds, and souls for joy to enter more brightly into our lives. God of grace, allow us the wisdom to appreciate the pleasures in our lives, even amidst the struggles that happen every day and the griefs that overwhelm us. Give us the spirit to be messengers of love, even when others don't appreciate our best efforts. May our giving and receiving of joy be the foundation for us to shine your light. Amen. Strange Schroeder. Did you know that while people of color are only 22% of the population in Boulder County, they comprise 41% of our COVID-19 cases, 47.7% of the hospitalizations, and 23.9% of the deaths? Unfortunately, because people of color have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, um, we have wanted to do something about it. 
Um, and so our church's social justice working group just this week has sent letters to public health officials as well as the governor advocating that people of color are considered within the vaccine's implementation plan and get access to the vaccine soon. So um, we're doing this work with the letter writing campaign. We're analyzing the results of the recent survey. And this is just the start of our group's work. So please stay tuned for future updates. Thanks. And to all people in our midst, peace be with you. And peace be with you all. today comes from Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 7 verse 14. The wilderness and the dry land will be glad. Even the desert will rejoice and blossom. Strengthen weak hands, make firm your feeble knees. Say to those who are of fearful heart, be strong, do not be afraid, here is your God. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. The lame shall leap like a deer. A highway shall be there, a holy way. That is the path for redemption. Sorrow and sighting shall flee away. The Lord's own self will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son. And she shall name him Emmanuel. God is with us. Our Advent theme this week is joy. I love all the Advent themes, but this one is a little more special to me because it's my sister's name. So I think about the Advent, the joy Advent, and I think of the joy that she is to me. When you look up the word joy in a thesaurus or you Google it, it says delight, happiness, rejoicing, amusement. The emotion of joy is associated with these feelings but I think joy, the true emotion of joy, is profound and deeply sincere. In the book, The Book of Joy, by the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, they have a list of words associated with joy, from pleasure, like eating your favorite food, to gratitude, to spiritual radiance, which is a serene joy born from a deep well-being. If you, ever, if you have ever seen either of these two men in person, online, or read one of their books, you will hear and you will see and you will feel spiritual radiance bubbling through each of them. And it is not just their words, it is the spirit behind their words. These two men, one who is a refugee, escaped his country of Tibet under disguise in the middle of the night, and summited 19,000 foot mountain peaks and passes to get to safety. The other grew up under apartheid in South Africa, had an abusive father, and is a cancer survivor. They have many reasons not to have any joy, yet both have dedicated their lives to teaching, encouraging, and showing compassion, <coughs> kindness, reconciliation, and joy. Their suffering and difficulties as they say, is just part of their curriculum. They believe there are eight pillars of joy and well-being, perspective, humility, humor, acceptance, forgiveness, gratitude, compassion, and generosity. I believe these are right in line with Jesus' teachings and his purpose for being on earth. The Dalai Lama points out that if you don't have genuine love, and kindness and joy to yourself, you can't extend it to others. The more we turn toward others, the more joy we experience. The more joy we experience, the more we can bring joy to others. The goal is not to just create joy for ourselves, but as the Archbishop says, be a reservoir of joy, an oasis of peace, a pool of serenity that can ripple out to all those around you. 
let's work at pushing some of our ripples of joy to the people around us, as Jesus did for us with his birth and death and life. I hope we can all feel sincere joy that is deep in our soul and our well-being. And remember, well-being and finding joy, the spiritual radiance, is not like Samatina Mountain. It is like a flowing river with smooth stretches and rough rapids, but always with the assurance that you are never alone. Advent and Christmas is about Emmanuel, God with us, with us in hope, peace, love, and joy. sister's name is Joy. Next week we're going to get into names, a lot of what some of these names mean, but it's not fair that women get cool names like Joy, and Summer, and Melody, and Hope, all these guys, just, we get stuck with boring names. Um, I have a friend whose name is Joy, and she had a baby boy, and she wanted a boy to be named something more joyful. So she named him Gideon, and they call him Giddy, which I think is just as sweet as it gets. Um, I, if you've been around this church for more than five minutes, you should probably know that I am a uh, bit of a geek. Amen? Yeah, yeah, a little yeah. Bit of, yeah there's a lot of heads nodding here. Um, you don't have to believe anything about Jesus, but if you spent any time at this church, you've probably heard me get all geeky about first century Roman archaeology and what that implies about church history, blah, 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 blah. Whether you pay a lick of attention to the Bible, you've probably nodded off. I get so excited about some Greek or Hebrew word and the conjugation and the literary context and yada, yada, yada. You might have never prayed in any formal way, but I hope, and this is a caring geek in me, I hope and plan in these services for these subtle aspects of worship to matter. Even though I know most of the time, those little brushstrokes don't make much of a difference to anyone except for me. Uh, so sermon, man, yeah, sure, some of you think that's the central part of worship, but very often I get most jazzed about the little details that could turn our time into something more resonant with deep meaning. And I know John picks up on this sometimes. I've heard it from Dean and from David and Kathleen and many people I know. You, you catch certain things sometimes, like when a key word of Scripture lands into a good hymn. <clears throat> I love when that happens. Or when Sarah picks up this detail of Scripture and she brings it into meaning for the kids, either in here or out when we used to be able to have fellowship. I just love when that happens. Or Daniel hears a phrase of a sermon and he picks just the right offertory. And you, know, you leave here never humming my words, but when he picks up on that, you leave humming his notes in your soul, which is a great way to be a church. Amen? Amen. So those are some of the things that excite me about my job of sharing good news with you. And today I'm excited that I'm going to get to geek out about Latin, Greek, and Hebrew in one sermon. I'm going to tie it in with some Buddha and some Freud and even some Julia Child so that God is always with us, so often in the background, but can become more clear and more thrilling in the center of our attention. So, see, a long time ago, a bunch of church nerds, way nerdier than me, if you can imagine, they took on the task to give shape to the Christian calendar. And we worship each week partly to tell our busy lives that stress does not have control over us. Stress does not have control over us. Amen? Amen. And the church has this yearly calendar, this rhythm of holy days, partly to tell the busy world that there are more important things than constant motion and growth. Things like Sabbath rest, and forgiveness and humility. Wouldn't the world be a better place if we could focus more on those things than the things that usually get headlines? So these guys, all guys back then, they said, here are some themes, here are some scriptures, not required, but here are some ways that wisdom has passed down from holy men and women. Here are some ideas and feelings and insights and encouragements about God that might be a good starting point for your rhythm of faith. Here's a story, here's a word, here's an ingredient. Now you take it wherever the inspiration might lead you. Some congregations like to take that guidance and follow those recipes really closely. 
maybe you've been in that church. Maybe you miss being in a church where things are very kind of regimented. It's an, it, 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 God requires honor, and so we follow things just right. Other congregations are like me in a kitchen. There's a place to begin and room for a whole lot of adaptability. Some churches like to bake faith, where the recipe is a precise list of ingredients and steps. Other churches, when the recipe calls for some butter, we might put in two sticks instead of one. When it calls for cinnamon, we might just have nutmeg and we don't even have cinnamon. We make it work how we do. Neither style is right or wrong, but a long time ago, these holy men and women have given us a recipe book. Here's what has worked for people of faith for generations. Now you take and you find it the way it works for you. That's the Julia Child's way of, of cooking and of worship. So these church nerds gave us a religious rhythm. And frankly, 90% of the time, that gets overshadowed or lost or ignored, except around Christmas. Because around Christmas, there are traditions, and you know the stories. You know the hymns. You know the themes. It probably helps to have a banner like we have here. And maybe sometimes people mix up Christmas hymns and Advent songs. And probably you focus more on the baby Jesus than Isaiah and John the Baptist and some of those weird stories. But around Christmas, if you've been doing this for any time, you're at least somewhat familiar with the script. You know the ingredients in our kitchen. And so, you might have heard it a couple weeks ago. Hope, yeah, that's what we need in the world today. We, as we prepare for light to enter the darkness, hope's a good ingredient. And, and last week, peace, yeah, that's the long goal that God moves into the neighborhood over and over to find peace in the world. And you might know that next week is? Love. Love, exactly. Next week is love, the ultimate expression of God's presence in all situations. Which means today is joy. Where we sung my favorite carol earlier, O Tidings of Comfort and Joy. And this week, like nearly every year we do this, and this feels reminiscent, joy is connected to this passage that Emily read about the desert blooming into flowers and fruit. And this week, like nearly every year, joy is connected with that other passage from 600 years before Jesus about a young woman who will give birth to a man who will transform the world, whose very name or his nickname at least, means the presence of God, the Hebrew word God with us. And you know through these images and expressions and through this joy, this reminder of grounding ourselves in joy, you know because you have at least a little bit of church geek in you, you know life would be better, life's intended to be better, God's very dream for you is better if we could live with less fear and more joy, less anxiety and more joy, less distraction and more joy. Okay, Greek, nerdy, tangent. Hope, peace, and love are all nouns. Those are three themes of Advent about kind of esoteric, emotional things that we go after. But the church nerds who molded the holy rhythms around joy, that's a verb. And more than just a verb, it's actually a command. It's, it's the word rejoice. Do it now. Have some joy. Joy is not some thing out there that we strive to in our soul or in society, like embodying hope or rehearsing peace or creating love. No. Joy is something, at least as it was designed and handed down to us, it is something in the language that is more subtle, but Buddhists said this stuff is too, said this exactly the same. They knew, Buddhists knew, Christians knew, and they want you to remember that joy is inside. It is something that comes from us innately, endemic to what it means to live fully. You have an essential aspect of joy from your heart. Freud knew it just the same. You choose to see joy onto the world. So do it. Unleash it. Live it. Fully. So that's the Greek tangent. But what does it really, what does that bring to us? The point of our time together, what would it look like to live like that? To have those eyes on the world. To have that heart oriented toward joy. In a world full of such bad news and cheap entertainment, what would it be like for you to obey a divine directive to rejoice? And maybe just to clarify our terms, so that we know what is not an answer to that question. If joy is a posture of the soul, from the inner heart toward any circumstance you find yourself in, then there's this other word, happiness. Happiness, as far as I understand it, is this fleeting feeling you get from any situation outside. Happiness isn't bad. Happiness is great. But at least in distinction to joy, and it's related to hapless and happenstance, happiness is just sort of an accidental emotion based on whatever happens to you. So which do you think is going to help you to live more fully and closely to God? An accidental reaction to whatever good might accidentally happen to you? Or a committed decision to see the beauty and the wonder in whatever lands at your doorstep? 
So as happy as you might think you would be with that person or with this job or with that thing over there, as much as the world trains us to seek fulfillment in stuff and experiences, we all know deep down that the most joyous, the most content, are the biggest true belonging in our lives starts from the inside. Hence the command, rejoice. Because joy is not something out there. It is your way of interacting with the world. It is the holy perspective by which you can face anything that comes into your life. The way Isaiah says it, does he say the desert is blooming? No. He says the desert will bloom. He trusts. Does he say that weak hands and knees are magically healed? No. But that wouldn't stop joy from coming through weak hands and worn out knees. Is fear and pain erased in his vision? No. But we are eternally capable of responding through fear and pain in the world. So whatever it is, whether it's health or safety or life circumstances, these are all great contexts for how to approach and manifest real joy in a harsh world. They're like practice fields in which to establish a joyful response. And Isaiah doesn't say it in his famous Christmas passage, but we could add other practice fields. When we come across romantic relationships, or work, or friendship, or seeing the values of human flourishing come through parenting or politics, we get to choose to cultivate a joyful perspective from our souls to bring out into any situation. So whatever the context, good or bad, happy or destructive, Isaiah is saying, those things don't control you. You control you. You have, in body and mind, written into your code, you have the tools to look a lens of redemption onto the world. You have it. It's not reserved just for saints and nuns. All of us from inside can respond to life better. We can prepare our responses. We can cultivate habits of responses, which that's basically what religion is, cultivating habits of responses into the world. Whether you get caught up in that through psychotherapy or mindfulness or even, oh my gosh, organized religion, at some level, we all share this goal of cultivating better responses in less anxious ways. And you have it, so make it happen. Which might make you wonder, well, how do I have that? Where does that come from? I mean, there are biological factors, and maybe it's some evolution thing, but why is joy somehow a better way to live? Why does joy exist in the world? Why are we the sort of creatures that can have joy and experience it and enter onto its whole? And this comes to the other verse that Emily read from Isaiah. The young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and she shall name him Emmanuel, God with us. It is the Christmas season, so you can absolutely take that verse as some uh, looking forward about Jesus. 600 years before his birth, this Hebrew prophet, facing the inevitable destruction of his country and a threat to the very values of human well-being, says that God will be born into the world. 600 years later, again, in the midst of political upheaval that threatened the coherence of holy values for all life, the story echoed. God was born in the world. 2,000 years hence, in the midst of all kinds of stuff, God is born in the world. God is with us, eternally present. And for what it's worth, when the Gospel writers refer to this verse from Isaiah, and when they call the Gospel writers call Mary a virgin, whereas the verse that Emily read called her a young woman. Those words in Hebrew and Greek are the exact same word, but they're translated different in English. In the prudish Hebrew culture, well, obviously, a young woman is a virgin, so we don't have to say it. But in the more libertine Greek culture, they wanted to put a point on it that young maidens are necessarily maidens. Which means that the Bible doesn't explicitly say that Mary was or was not sexually active before marriage. You can believe that. You can believe the miracle that is carried through Christian tradition for 2,000 years. But that image comes through an accident of the Greek language. And it can, if you get sidetracked and get focused on that too much, it will separate us from the essential message of the Bible that God is with us. That's where we're called to land. That is the essence of the biblical message that God is with us. And it is the essential grounding for why joy can spring from us. Because we are not alone, but grounded in God. God is with us closer than our heartbeat. We are essentially formed with the values that shape the best way of living. We're formed with the potential to see a better world. We are knit together with the potential to share and receive grace. 
We are weaved into a world such that it is natural and right to honor diversity, to strive for equity, and to dream for a beloved community. So come, come Emmanuel, be present with us. Amen. <laughs>
May joy carry you through this week. May you carry others with your joy. Amen.